we continue together with our opening hymn, which I will share on my screen. We continue together on page three of our bulletin. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed, and blessed be the kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we and the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim it to the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh be believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone great and small put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will pray the psalm responsibly by half verse. For God alone, my soul in silence waits. Truly, my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. My stronghold, so that I shall not be shaken. In God is my safety and my honor. God is my strong rock and my refuge. Put your trust in him always, O people. Pour out your hearts before him, for God is our refuge. Those of high degree are but a fleeting breath. Even those of low estate cannot be trusted. On the scales they are lighter than a breath. All of them together. Put no trust in extortion, in robbery take no empty pride. Though wealth increase, set not your heart upon it. God has spoken once, twice have I heard it. That power belongs to God. 
Steadfast love is yours, O Lord. For you, For you repay you. everyone according to his deeds. A reading from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. We continue uh, with our gospel procession. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. After John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in the boat mending the nets. Immediately he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. This week we had the first of the five classes that I am teaching in conjunction with Rabbi J. Rosenbaum through the JCC. It's a group of about 20 Christians and 20 Jews coming together to learn about the history behind our shared faiths and the divergences. What became apparent immediately is that we have so much language to unpack and explain together to each other. Within minutes, there were questions about what is a rector? What should they call me? And so on and so forth. Jay got questions such as what is the Tanakh? And we found ourselves swimming through the waters of translation starting to try to understand one another, what our liturgies are, what our words are that we ascribe to each other. One of the questions that came out has stuck with me since that, that class. It was a question that asked about what exactly is evangelism versus conversion versus proselytizing. It was framed in some way in there in the midst of those words. And it's a question that Jay and I have spent a good amount of time talking about in preparing for the class. Because conversion has such a negative history within Christian and Jewish relations. Because Christians have spent an enormous amount of time trying to convert the Jews. And those conversions have not always been and rarely have been voluntary. Christianity has a bit of a negative history when it comes to conversion and to evangelism. And that is what I think of as soon as I hear this gospel. Drop your nets and I will make you fishers of people. So often within the church, this gospel is used as a call to evangelism. 
a call to convert people. Look at the imagery of fishing, entrapping an animal to catch and to consume. It's not all that pleasant of an image of how we want to coerce people into Christianity. We don't want to coerce people at all. And yet that has been the history. We've seen it through missionaries and colonialization. The history of doing this work and how this gospel has been used has been dangerous. When we assume that this text or that any text calls us to go out and to make more Christians, we are entering dangerous waters, not only of history, but of textual interpretation. What exactly is the gospel calling us or asking us to do? The thing is, with this particular text, I'm not sure Jesus was at all focused on us going out to convert anyone else to this belief system, despite the many ways in which we've used this text to uphold that practice. Interpreter and theologian Ched Myers proposes a different way of looking at this text. We have to situate it within the economic structure of the world and the time of these particular fishermen and Jesus. To be a fisherman was to be a part of the economic world in which they lived. It was to participate in taxation and in the whole system which supported not only one's family, but supported the government, the Roman Empire. To be a fisherman was to participate in the status quo of how the world functioned, of how money functioned, how taxation functioned, and how the Romans functioned. When Jesus calls them to come and follow him and he will make them fishers of men, the text is focusing not so much on those whom they will fish for, but on themselves and what they are being asked to leave. The text is about them. The text is about us. To lay down one's nets, to stop fishing for fish, that is to stop participating in the economic situation of their world. It was to disassociate and disconnect from the way in which money, taxation, and structure controlled their lives. To do that would require a complete shift in how one lives, to change their own financial fortune, to change the way they interact with their neighbors, with the ruling government. This is about how Jesus was calling the fishermen to live within their own world. It was not about these other unknown, unnamed people to bring into the fold, but about bringing these fishermen into the fold, to bring them into living in the world of Christ, which is in many ways rejecting the way in which we are accustomed to living. Now, what if this text is about us? Not sending us out on some mission to grow the church, to entrap people into the pews, to make our numbers bigger, to make more people profess the faith of Christ, but instead to ask us to actually be Christians, which calls us to live our lives in a way that is so often counter to what the popular world would have us living it. Jesus rejects the way in which we are controlled by economics, by power. Jesus rejects the way we become slaves to money and accumulation and wealth. The foundation of the gospel is to live our lives like Christ. And in doing that, 
we are fundamentally being asked to change our relationship with money, with acquisition, and with how we live our lives. Jesus is asking us to worry about ourselves and how it is that we will live. For me, this is aspirational, not an actuality. I know personally, I still live in a world where money and things can cause stress and worry, scarcity or abundance. It is aspirational to live in the way that Jesus calls us, to let go of that relationship with economics that we believe upholds us and will save us. As a community, we are being called, probably aspirationally, but maybe even more achievably, to live in a way that is a different relationship with what the markers of success are. This is appropriate as we'll next week have our annual meeting. We'll look at budgets and income. We'll look at what we're able to do. Bishop Greg Rickle always says, we have precisely enough money to do whatever it is that God is calling us to do. We do not always need to focus on more to be successful. If our relationship with all that we have is truly in relation to Jesus and to building up the kingdom of God, often we are being asked how quickly can we give it away to build that kingdom to not hoard or participate in unjust structures, but to counteract the way in which we've been taught to live to build up the kingdom of God. Now, I actually think that there might be a point of evangelism in the end of all this, even as I rejected that from the offset. We can't start with evangelism. And we certainly can never go to conversion, forced or otherwise. Evangelism to me is sharing the good news and being a witness to the goodness of Christ. If we actually can live our lives as individuals and as a community in the way in which Jesus calls us to, then we have a story to tell a story of how we have been changed by Christ, a story of how Christ manifests in our lives, a story of how we are different and countercultural, a story that is compelling and worth telling over and over and over. It is a story that contains the good news. If we are truly walking the path of Christ, then we have a story of how God has been in our lives. And that is a story we're sharing, not for the sake of bringing others into the fold, but for the sake of sharing the light of Christ far and beyond ourselves. Because it is a light that is worth sharing, is a compelling story that begs to be out in the world. During the JCC class this week, I casually mentioned that my sister is Jewish and I am Christian and I kind of moved along. And at one point, someone who didn't know me stopped me and said, can you, you have to tell us what that story is. There was something compelling and interesting, some nugget of truth, curiosity, that begged for that story to be told. Do I think it would make anyone in that room who wasn't Christian a Christian already? Absolutely not. (laughs) And I wouldn't want it to. But fundamentally, the countercultural moment of my family, 
allowing my sister and me to go our separate ways as children is a profound moment of God working in our lives and in our family and a story that is worth sharing. A story that manifests how God can work if we get out of God's way. If we lean in to the uncomfortable places that God calls us, there will be a story so compelling we cannot help but share it. And we will be so moved by Christ that we cannot help but manifest that in the world. If we are bold enough to look at how we are called to reject the status quo as individuals and as a community, there's a profound reality that we may live into. And perhaps we will participate in the greatest story that there is to share, the story of being in relationship with God. Amen. Together, we join in professing our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed on page six. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And virtually we greet each other. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. As we move into our offertory, I'll remind you that the information to text to give in our virtual passing the plate is in your bulletin. All that you give and do to support this church allows us to continue our ministry and continue to move into uh, a return uh, to in-person worship as a hybrid to what we're doing now, which we'll talk more about uh, during the announcements. Uh, so. Thank you for all that you give and all the ways you support this community. You can give through text, you can give through our website, and you can give through the mail, uh, but thank you for giving.
In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world, and we especially ask for your blessings on and guidance to our new national government. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For our presiding bishop and our bishop and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, especially in our country, 25 million people who have been diagnosed with COVID-19, and the 420,000 who have died. And closer to home, Jillian Barlow, Jim Cameron, Digby Coleman, Jupe Compton, Glenn Crosby, Glorian Crosby, Deanna Glenn, Diane Goodman, Mark Hall, Lorna Hamill, Bob Hayward, Anna Hooper, Rosemary Howell, Peter Mackenheimer, Linda Mullen, Claire Parkinson, Anique Labru Reardon, Pam Rhodes, Karen Rowley, Ron Smith, Vicki Smith, Don Snow, William Victory, Vivian, Julie Wiegand, Peter Wiley. You're invited to add also your own prayers of concern, either silently or aloud. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life, uh, especially those celebrating birthdays this week. Uh, that would be Tammy Felker, Renee Milkey, Debbie Wiegand, Jocelyn Miller, and Audrey Greaves. You're invited to add your own thanksgivings here, either silently or aloud or in the chat. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. <clears throat> we pray for all those who have died especially Sam Bogar, Niall Clark, Mar Mullen, Dean Saffel, Marjorie Tholen, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. You are invited to name those who have died, either silently or loud or in the chat.
Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The blessing and forgiveness of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you this day. Amen. Together, let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We pray together the prayer for spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving as I proclaim your resurrection. I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot receive you in the sacrament of your body and blood, come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you and you in me in this life and in the life to come. Amen. We have a few birthdays to celebrate this week. I believe Debbie is here. Happy birthday, Debbie. I didn't see Audrey Greaves here, but happy birthday, Audrey. Happy birthday, parents. Parents always need a shout out on kids' birthdays. Well done. Any other birthdays or anniversaries that I uh, haven't mentioned or someone you want to call out? Well, we pray for them all and we join together in the birthday anniversary and general Thanksgiving. Let us pray. Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in your heart, in their hearts, may your peace, which passes all understanding, abide all the days of their lives through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Happy birthdays. The blessing of God Almighty, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, be with you and those you love and those you pray for that together we may walk in the path of Christ and know Christ's presence in our lives this day and always. Amen. Together, we will join in the closing hymn, which I will share.
in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.